Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please rise for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 1. Glory be to you, O Lord. This will also serve as today's sermon text. At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. For why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him. From generation to generation, He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So how does one achieve greatness? We talked about it just now with the Sunday school children about what it takes to be great. But well, what does it take to be great in anything? What does it take to become a great parent or a great student, a great boss, a great worker? What does it take for someone to be considered the greatest of all time in sports or in the arts? In simple truth, it's work. <laughs> It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of practice. You, in order to achieve greatness, you need to work harder than everyone else. You need to put in the effort. You need to make. You need to dedicate your life at being able to become the greatest and the best. And we live in a world that desires greatness, that wants to be great, that wants to achieve greatness, that wants to be known as better than anyone. And so we put in a lot of work into being great, into being recognized, into being able to say, I am better at something than somebody else, which sets me apart from everybody else. Well, in the Gospel lesson, as we looked at the Song of Mary, Mary talked about greatness. She said that from now on, all generations will call me blessed or great. Mary was great because she was, is, was given a great title. Mother of the Savior of the world. Mother of God. That's quite the title. That's quite the accomplishment. And, and so rightly so, she should be great. But as you listen to the song of Mary, or if you, when you look into God's word, what is it that made Mary so great? What made it that she was so worthy of such a title, such a designation that God would choose her to be his mom. Well, in the words of Mary, nothing. She didn't do anything. She didn't work harder than anybody else. She wasn't more likable than anyone else. No, she wasn't better than anybody. Even she admitted that. And yet God made her great. When we look at greatness in this world, we'll see that there is a differing view on what is greatness and how one achieves it. You have 
the world's point of view, and you have God's. And when we compare the two, both are striving for to be high up there, to be elevated, but only one truly gets you there. Only one will actually make you great, while the other one will simply die off and disappear over time. When we think of what it means to be great, we must look to the one who makes us great. And we, in order to do that, we need to know who it is who is truly great. And that is our God. He is the one who is number one, the creator of all the universe, the perfect one. And therefore, he is the one who gets to designate who is great and who is not, and how one achieves it. And for our sake, God has chosen not to require us to do anything to make us great. And so, like Mary today, we can sing our songs of joy. We can praise our God, because He is the one who lifts us up to greatness, greatness that will last for all eternity. So why did Mary sing? What inspired her? What made her all of a sudden have this impromptu song come out of her lips as if she was living in a musical? I mean, we could think of a lot of reasons why she should have sung. I mean, just following the Gospel of Luke, we can see what happened in her life. First of all, she was visited by an angel. And then that angel had a great message for her. And that message was that she, a virgin, was going to have a child. And on top of that, that child was going to be God himself and the heir to David's throne, God and man in one. He was going to share her humanity, and he was going to be her savior. And on top of that, she got to witness some of the great works of God. She found out firsthand that when God makes a promise, it happens. She got to see it by going to her relative, Elizabeth's house. A woman in her old age, who should not be having children, was now pregnant and in her sixth month. And she got to witness that. And see it to be true. And on top of that, she even got to experience the type of greeting, the way people are going to look at her and know about her and think of her. They're going to, she's going to hear words of blessings as she hears her relative exclaim that she is so honored to be in Mary's presence. And even how the unborn child, John, was already weeping for joy at the sound of her voice. But yet, that's not why Mary sang. That's not the content of her song at all. She doesn't talk about how Elizabeth greeted her or how a, a baby jumped for her or even what the angel said about what she was going to be and how she was going to be it. No, she sang about something different. And it had to do with the angel's greeting, what the angel said to her, but it was before he even said anything about virgin birth, son of God, and son of man. Before he said anything about her, her relative having a baby. Before she even heard the greeting of Elizabeth and John the Baptist. The angel said, Mary, greetings, you who are highly favored. God was, good, was had favorable interest in Mary. Literally what the angel said to her is, Mary, greetings, you who are liked by God. God liked her. And that's interesting to think about because when we think about the difference between love and like, like is in many cases stronger than love. Because we can love someone, but we don't necessarily like everyone that we love. We might love someone, but at this time, we really don't like them because of something they might have done, something they might have done to disappoint us. But yet we still love them, and so we can continue on with the relationship. But to like someone means that you're happy about everything that they're doing, that you're excited to be next to them, that you want to be associated with them at all times. And here God is saying to a sinner, a sinner like you and me, I like you. I want to be near you. I want to be associated with you. I want you to be the mother of me. 
What an amazing statement. And as that message sunk into Mary's mind, she started to learn something that we all need to remember about our God. And that is, when it comes to who God chooses to like and who he chooses to use and who he chooses to be associated with, it's never what we think it should be. In fact, God will often choose the very things the world around us would so easily reject. And God rejects everything this world would so easily choose. And that's why Mary sang. We hear it throughout this song how he humbles the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Even Mary acknowledged that she is great because God looked upon her lowly state. Mary understood that she didn't deserve anything that God was doing for her. She wasn't picked to be liked or to be the mother of Jesus because of anything she had done. She doesn't even put any of it on her. She just acknowledges that now everyone is going to call me great. Why? Because God made me great. Mary shows us where we find our greatness, and it isn't in our achievements. It isn't in how we pat ourselves on the back. It has nothing to do with us at all. It has everything to do with God and how he chooses to look at us, and he chooses to like us and to love us and to be associated with us and to save us. It's a far cry from how maybe we're conditioned to think in this world. Because this world is consumed with greatness, isn't it? It's all that the world thinks about. You watch anything. It doesn't matter if it's sports or if it's the arts or if it's just life. In general, people are consumed with being great at what they do. They want to be recognized for their greatness. They want to be the employees of the month or of the year. They want to receive those bonuses. They want to be known as great bosses who get things done. Sports players want to be known as the greatest of all times. They want to be so great that they want people to think, you're so good, you would have been great in the past, now, or even in the future. No one could top you. Even celebrities, they try to garner all these awards and accolades. Why? So then they're talked about, they're remembered, they're loved, and they're thought about. Even politicians want to be known as great. They want to be known as beloved. They want to be remembered. They don't want to be forgotten. And because we live in this world, we're influenced by it. I mean, we too want to be great. In fact, the thought can even be that we won't, that many of us will have is that if we find out that someone isn't even trying to be great at whatever they're, trying, they're attempting, then we look at them as if they're lazy or if they don't know what they're doing or that they don't even deserve the award that's coming to them because they're not even trying to be great. Sometimes we won't even participate in certain events with other people if we don't think someone is great. There have been times where people won't even play a simple game with somebody else just because they're not great at it. And so it won't be fun. It won't be enjoyable. In fact, we're so consumed with greatness, how often have we decided, I'm not going to try it. It doesn't matter if I'll still have fun failing, or I'll learn something about myself, or that it will be a good building process. But no, if I'm not great at it, if I'm not already good at it, I'm not even going to try it. I'm not even going to put in an effort. We are influenced by the greatness that this world is trying to to achieve. But the problem is that if we focus on what the world considers to be great or try to achieve greatness in the eyes of the world, we will quickly find out God's not there because we turned our back on him. God has left the scene completely because in the realm of human glory, there is no room for God because we're too busy worshiping ourselves. And that's not to say God doesn't want us to do our best. He certainly does. In fact, he commands us to give 100% no matter what. Even if we fail miserably, at least, you do, at least you're giving your best because you want to give glory to God. But 
if we're doing this because we're trying to pat ourselves on the back or we want people to recognize us, recognize us as being great, then we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Because while we can try our best, we can still fail at whatever we're trying, and, and that's okay. Because that's not where we find greatness. That's not where we find our value. That's not where we can find our confidence and our self-worth of being able to say, I'm great, I'm glorious, I'm awesome, even though I may not be awesome at that. But we're looking in the wrong place if we're looking at our own achievements, our own works, our own glory. Instead, we must look to where Mary found it. Where did Mary find greatness? Again, she didn't find it in being an awesome person. I'm sure she was a great person, a nice person. She was probably well-liked. But again, that, that wasn't why God chose her. God chose her because God decided to. Same goes for us. Why did God choose to save you? Why did God choose to give you faith? Was it because you were amazing by yourself? And the answer is no. And we need to realize that. We need to realize that the only reason why we're, we believe what we believe is because of God and the work that he put in. We find God in, in humility. And God's really good at humbling us. And the, only, and the reason why he does that is because that's where we will find him in true greatness. That's where he can lift us up because we're no longer trying to lift ourselves up. And he does that, he humbles us by forcing us to compare ourselves with him. Because if we truly want to be great, well then we must compare ourselves to one who is truly great. And that is our perfect God. And how do we stack up to him? Not even close, right? I mean, is there any accomplishment we can even lay out that would, might even make God go, that's nice. No. Why? Because we wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for God giving us the ability to do it. We can't take credit for anything. We can't even take credit for the fact that we're breathing and our hearts are beating and our minds are thinking. And that we were able to get out of bed and find a way to get here. We still can't take credit for that. Because we wouldn't be able to do the simple things in life if it wasn't for God. Not alone the great achievements that we might be able to achieve because of the gifts and the abilities and the motivation that God gives us. Everything still falls into God's category. God can say, your achievement is my achievement. Your greatness is my greatness. The fact that you're able to do anything is because of me. We give nothing to the category of greatness. We can't even come close to comparing to God in any way. And that's exactly what God needs us to know. So then he can show us that we are great. Again, not because of us, but because of him. Mary knew that she was blessed and that she was going to be blessed. And that she was going to be considered great by everyone. But it was because that God chose to like her. God likes you as well. He shouldn't, right? Because we do so much to disappoint him every day. He should just simply say, I love you despite yourselves. But no, he goes further than that. He says, I like you. I want to be with you. I want to be associated with you. I want you to be my family. And the only reason why God can say that is because of what he did at Christmas and Easter. He came and then he accomplished the work that was needed to be done to save us, to make us holy, to make us perfect, in a sense, to make us great in his eyes. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why Christmas is so special. No matter what's going on in our lives. We could have, this time of year could be the worst time of year for all of us. And because of Jesus, this is still the most wonderful time of the year. Our planning could all fall apart. Everything could go wrong. And yet we have every reason to celebrate and call this year another successful year. We could even suffer immense loss, huge tragedies. And yet we can still find joy and peace. 
And that's because this season isn't resting on the fact of whether or not we cook the food right or we get the right present or we do the right thing or everything comes together. It doesn't rely on us at all for this season to be great. Instead, it relies once again on our God and the fact that he came to save us. We could have nothing, and because of God, we still have everything. So as we get ready to celebrate this coming Friday evening, let us remember that. That's why we're here. That's why we're celebrating. We're celebrating the fact that we have a Savior who liked us, who still likes us, who came and saved us and continues to rule for us, who continues to keep us in his arms and in his family, who continues to look at us and says, every single one of you is great in my eyes. Amen. Please rise.